Welcome back to the Fantasy Network. I am, of course, Jimmy Nuts. And uh, before I get started today, I just want to say thank you so much. We recently just passed uh, 1,000 subs on the channel, uh, which has taken less than a year to do. And that is really cool, and I'm really excited that I have this community um, with you all. And I love talking fantasy, sci-fi, and any, t any type of thing uh, with you guys out in the comments. So I just really want to say I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I can't wait for us to grow even more. Hopefully not too, too big because <laughs> I like responding to every comment and all that good stuff. Uh, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Now let's get down to business. Today, we are talking about the grandfather of science fiction. That's right. Isaac Asimov. I'm reviewing the Foundation Trilogy. Oh boy, this was pretty fun. And I did not know what to expect going in and I was pleasantly surprised for many reasons. And uh, we're gonna get into that right now. Also, can I just say, uh, I actually own two different copies of this book, but I got the, uh, let's see if you can see it. Hopefully the camera focuses on it a little bit. Um, this edition of Foundation from Barnes & Noble, the classics edition, beautiful. Um, feels very well bound. It has your chapter marker here, your little bookmark built in, and it has like this gold trim on the pages. I, I think I got it on sale. Maybe it's only like $20, $25, uh, which, you know, isn't cheap. But after reading, I was like halfway through book two and I put down my kind of general omnibus version and I went and got this. It does have all three books, which is really cool. And I can't recommend this edition enough. I didn't increase the side either, but you can really see I think, yeah, you can kind of see the spine. Just really high quality and really special if you really enjoy the story. So just kind of wanted to throw that out there for you. One of the very first surprises that uh, that got to me was the fact that this was written in 1951 and really you have no idea that it could have been written then. It could have been written in the 90s, uh, maybe not necessarily today, but it feels very fresh and very modern still, even though it was written in 1951. I think as Isaac Asimov is someone we need to tip our hat to when we think about Star Wars and we think about Dune, pretty much any kind of imperialist theme in in or a big galactic empire. This is the first time this had been done. I think this work is very approachable, even almost 70 years later, We're almost at the 70th anniversary of when he wrote the first Foundation book. And in books one, two, and three that I'm reviewing here, every single one of them felt pretty modern to me. And if you're like me, uh, I kind of expected going in, I didn't have a ton of expectation, I didn't know what to expect, but I assumed that we'd be getting this very non-personable narrative uh, of macro movements through a big galaxy, like, you know, this fleet went here and such, but that is not the case. Uh, you know, one of the things that I love about Star Wars is the fact that we get a very personalized scope uh, in a grand adventure, in a grand empire, in a grand galaxy. And we get that here, although it's uh, done in a very different way, which I think is where readers will probably split on this story. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. So it didn't feel like I was in the macro actions of the story. I felt very personalized when I read this. And it wasn't dry at all. This, this work has a lot of personality, albeit some of it feels a little bit mechanical. Uh, again, it was written in 1951, but I think it's just the approach to the story that he took and where we put see these time jumps that come. So I should probably really tell you about Harry Seldon first. So essentially, Harry Seldon is a genius, a mathematician, and he's doing the art of psychohistory, which the Galactic Empire is in a decline, and this man is singing it at the top of the roofs, right, to say, hey, this is going to end. And he has basically donned a, a psychohistory where he can predict where the empire and humanity as a whole in this galaxy is going to go. He can account for macro events that are going to happen into the future to like a 96 to 98 percent accuracy, which is pretty amazing. And it kind of sets the tone for the whole story. Uh, the Empire clearly doesn't like that Harry Seldon is saying that this is going to fall. He believes that he can help, uh, maybe, if that's his true intention, right? Uh, we're keeping this spoiler free. But... The cool thing about Harry Seldon's psychohistory is that not only does it uh, predict these big uh, crises, which they call Seldon crisis uh, in the future in the story, but it can't account for personal, micro, individual level decisions that could impact the micro. So you kind of see that it's almost like a freedom of choice theme, right? Uh, do we have the, you know, our free will? at stake here where maybe all these things are supposed to happen but can we change it with our personal decisions and it plays a role in this story 
So psychohistory, predicting the macro future of, of where this civilization is going, but can't account for persons. Hmm. Interesting, right? And pretty much right then I was hooked. Uh, that is a theme that I think it, free will, I think most people have thought about that. And I think Isaac addresses it very well in book one to set up the story. But then later on in book two and three, when he really delves into it and you start seeing some of these Selden crises uh, be morphed by what's happening because of the individuals that we're connecting with and that we're hearing about, I think that's where like the story really has its charm and its shine. And now I guess this is where I need to talk about the approach that Isaac Asimov took when writing uh, books one, two, and three of Foundation. There are, oh, by the way, other entries in Foundation, and it ends up connecting with iRobot down the road, which is something that I think I might read. Uh, but I'm strictly talking about books one, two, and three, the Foundation trilogy here. His approach to this story was to, it's almost like a collection of short stories where there is a time gap in between each of these stories, like little arcs, right? And sometimes they're aware of each other. Uh, that is something that happened in the past. And sometimes you're just with people who are actually making these massive decisions and are part of these massive situations that have impacts on the entire civilization, but nobody else really knows about them. So you're getting almost like a, a history lesson, but it's not it's not written in a way a history book is. You, you are getting a personalized story in the arc and you're in those people's POVs and seeing them interact with each other. So it's just very unique. And if there's anything I could say about foundation in general, whether you like that approach or not, is that it is very unique. And again, 1951 is so original that it, it's hard for me not to feel inspired reading this. So yeah, we have our, our opening with Harry Seldon, stuff happens. And then again, you'll jump maybe 50 years in the future, 150 years in the future. I think at one point, maybe there's a 300 jump, but I might be wrong. I can't remember exactly all of the time periods, but I could see why some people might not like that. But I actually ended up enjoying it. I'm so used to having one cast throughout the entire trilogy or entire just one book. And that is not the case here. I got to meet so many people in different periods of this civilization and this, you know, I guess I can't really call it the Galactic Empire because some of these people are outside of that empire trying to uh, forge ahead into the new future. But whenever you get multiple point of views and multiple little story arcs that all kind of connect and tell this really grand, grand history, it's pretty special. And I would not mind seeing more stories like this. And this is coming from a person that is a character-driven reader. I don't think necessarily this is something that a character-driven reader would love, but you also can't really hate it because... I think that the characters, especially for the topics at hand and talking about trade and just like political schemes and throughout the civilization and, and the Galactic Empire, the, these like very unique situations that might come up dry, the characters really bring them to life. And I felt very invested in them, even though I had just met them. It can be a little jarring when the first portion of the arcs kind of open up on these time jumps. But by the end, I, I don't think there were really any besides in the third book, which I'll talk about. Uh, where I kind of dropped off. I was engaged from each jump every single time. But just know that it's not a continuity of one cast. Really, Harry Seldon kind of transcends time because of his legend, because of his work. So really, he he's the main character, but he's not. But he is the one consistent thing throughout the entire three books. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, this sounds really weird. <laughs> It is. It's, it's weird, but it's original, and I think it is an approachable work as long as you have the expectations going into it that is, this is not your typical uh, sci-fi or even fantasy story. These people uh, have actually lost uh, the ability to know where they have come from, meaning that the records have been lost. They don't know that they started on Earth, but these are people who have come from Earth and are now in our distant future. And I think it's really cool that Isaac Asimov was able to kind of picture how this would all go down. And it seems still to this day very plausible that if we were ever to expand out into the galaxies around us, that this this could end up being a situation. And how poorly ran big organizations, or, or I should say governments in this situation can be and how corrupt. Uh, also, it's really interesting. Again, this is written in 1951, which I've said like eight times now, but on the forefront of this, it's all kind of based around like nuclear technology. And it's just really interesting because I think in that time period in the 50s, they really felt probably even by 2000 that so much of what we do would be nuclear powered and that we would be evolving that technology. Not to say that we haven't, but I do think uh, if Asimov was alive today, he'd probably be shocked uh, that we haven't produced more 
uh, through that for various reasons, obviously. But in the 1950s, it was obviously on the forefront of everybody's mind. And you can see that reflected in his writing. So characters I can't really delve into because uh, one, spoilers, and two, it just we switch the cast of characters uh, pretty much every single arc, every single time jump. And that probably brings up a question like, James, is the pacing any good? I think so. I think if you're if you're willing to change um, perspectives and do these time jumps, if you're ready for that, I think the pacing's phenomenal. You almost feel like you've accomplished reading like a short story every time you end like one of the arcs. And Isaac Asimov, by the way, before this, wrote a ton of short stories. So it makes sense that his big grandioso trilogy is really just a lot of inter interconnected arcs uh, that just happen to go in chronological order. The part where it switches up, and the part I love the most, is at the end of book two, he kind of throws a curveball at you with the plot, with the characters. But the end of book two, like the, almost the back half, back quarter of book two, and then the first part of book three are very close-knit. We don't have those big time jumps. So you're getting a very chronological story that's tightly knit. And then we get another time jump like halfway through book three. Again, I had been used to that, but we, then we kind of broke that and we got this really interesting character in book two that you'll immediately recognize. <laughs> I won't even say uh, character's name uh, because it'll. You, I don't want you to Google it, okay? But we, we kind of stick with this character for a good portion of these books uh, of two and three, and then we do another time jump. I will say it kind of lost me on the time jump just because I had now like kind of nestled in and locked myself down to this... Uh, very precise storytelling that he was doing uh, that was different than the first half of the trilogy. Uh, but by the end, like I kind of, that was the first time I felt negative about the work. By the end of the book, I was still invested. I thought it wrapped up very nicely. And now I want to read more Asimov. So hats off. I think it was a success. Uh, but there is one thing to note there is just the, the time gap once he abandons it and then kind of comes back to it in book three. Uh, I wouldn't say it doesn't fit in the story, but it could be a bit jarring even to someone like me who is really enjoying it. And hey, if you're not so sure, guess what? Apple TV is putting out a foundation show. I think it's supposed to be their like flagship show. So, I mean, you gotta read it before <laughs> before the TV show comes out, right? And the nice thing about these, they're only 250 pages a piece. You could read the first foundation books, 250 pages, and not go to two or three. Once you start two, I think you need to go to three. Um, but you can read all three of them in an omnibus. You know, that, that book down there, it's only 750 pages. Uh, that's about equivalent to most of the fantasy I read. But if you want to break these up, you absolutely could. Because the plot is a little bit disconnected from the time jumps, you could absolutely break these up into smaller reading sessions, palate cleansers, what have you. I don't think that it's so complex to where you couldn't connect back if you hadn't read book one in a few months. It wouldn't be like that. So give, give book one a shot. 250 pages. You'll really get in, you'll dial into what Isaac Asimov's trying to get across. And one big thing about this that I enjoyed, if you're not a sci-fi person, you're sitting here like, hey, this is a fantasy network, James. What are you doing? Listen, I like sci-fi too. And the cool thing is, if you're into history at all, a lot of this, it, no, not a lot, it is based around the Roman Empire failing in the future. You know, it, it's, it's all influenced by Roman history. I find that captivating, and if you have found that interesting at any capacity, in any capacity in the past, I think that you would be enthralled by this trilogy and that you should really check it out. So that comes to the portion of the review where I say, well, who would enjoy this book? I think people would enjoy this book if they're just into galactic empires. Like if you've watched Star Wars and you love it, if you've read Dune even and you love that, all of those works were influenced by Foundation and Isaac Asimov. So I think for anybody who's into that, science in general, or strangely enough, Roman history, or if you love short stories, even though this obviously connects to a bigger arc, I think you could digest this very well. And those are the people that I would recommend this to. People who might not like this, uh, obviously people who don't really like sci-fi. Uh, I think people who also have uh, trouble with time jumps in the story would not like it and find it very jarring. And if you're really used to having one cast of characters throughout an entire story uh, where a plot is very neat and drawn out, I don't necessarily know if this would be it um, for you. So that's probably the people I would say maybe avoid this one. But overall, I would recommend everybody at least give the first book a shot because I enjoyed it so much. I got to finish it right before the end of 2020. And I was on cloud nine after finishing it. And it feels like an accomplishment because it's such an important piece of work. This might be the most influential piece of fiction I have read. 
you know, we talk about Tolkien, we talk about Le Guin. I, I think Asimov might be more influential than both of those writers. It's hard to say. That's a debate for another time. I'm not sure where I stand on it. But where I do stand is that I recommend everybody at least give it a shot. The Foundation Trilogy, if you just want to read book one, it's called Foundation by Isaac Asimov. And what a person he was. If you want to check out some of his old interviews, talks about mysticism and religion and just like common sense stuff. And we're talking about someone that lived in, you know, the 50s and 60s and so on and so forth. And was just a forward thinker, not only in our genre of science fiction and fantasy, but in life. And seemed like a cool dude. I wish I could have met him. But I'm glad that he lives on through his pieces of work. That's it. Big recommend here for the Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov. Are you going to check it out? Let me know. Have you already checked it out? What did you think? What are some of the big themes that you've seen taken from Foundation, if you have read it, into other ones? I'd love to know. Hit me up down in the comments. If you like this video, hit like. And if you want to see more like it, please hit subscribe. You can turn on the bell if you'd like. I post videos about once a week here uh, pretty consistently, and I respond to every single comment. I appreciate the dialogue with you guys and the conversation, and I want to keep building this community. So thank you so much for checking this out. And until I see you next time, remember to keep turning the page.